Well, let's go in our Bible this morning. Uh, we're not going to be in James. I just want to go over here to Luke, if you would please. Luke, Luke, yes sir. Interesting here this morning. You know, the Lord talks about patience with people and He's long-suffering, amen? He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. The Bible says that's a repeating verse in the Bible several times by Old Testament prophets. I preached on that one time. He's, the Lord is merciful, great kindness, slow to anger, and repents him of the evil that he would do to people because he's desiring them to turn to the Lord. And, you know, Brother Jake brought up this morning how God dealt with kings and you know, some of them, I mean, God dealt with them and he just wiped them out. Other ones, he dealt with them and they repented and they humbled themselves. And then later on in life and they go the wrong direction again. I mean, there's one thing I've figured out about God's ways. And there's a lot that I haven't figured out about God's ways. Amen. You can't put God in your box when it comes to his dealings with man. You could see some of the ways he deals with man. Because if you think about it. We look at the, the, the false doctrine, we look at the apostasy, we look at evil men and we say, how, Lord? I mean, it doesn't really make sense. Shouldn't God just wipe all them out? But then we look into our own life and we say, Lord, I was one of them. <laughs> we say, those people there, they're apostates. They, they, believe, they don't believe the Bible. How could God put up with them? And then we say, well, Lord, I was one of them. Amen. Um, you know, and it's amazing, really, that God is merciful with any of us here this morning uh, and that he is kind to any of us and that he's long-suffering to any of us uh, when we think about uh, the reality of what we should be and what God is. Amen. He's holy and we're not. And he's righteous and we're not. He's faithful and we're not. And it's going to be like that till the day we die. But I'll tell you this, we ought to always be trying to make our life right with God so that he can use us. We ought to al always be in a position where God can bless us, in a position where God can work through us. Amen. Um, Pastor Grove used to always say that. He said, Lord, he's going to work on you if you don't let him work in you. That's good. He's going to work on you if you don't let him work in you. So he has a way of saying, I love you. Come on now, let's get your heart back, you know. And he's patient and he's kind. But the Bible tells us that that grace of God should not produce lasciviousness in our life, which is, as the Bible says, a license to sin or to live like we want to live or what's right for ourselves. but it should produce a, a, a desire to live for the Lord greater. Lord, I can't believe you put up with me this year, this week, this day. Lord, I'm, I'm going to live for you tomorrow because you didn't kill me today. That's what it should do in our life. But the Bible says because of the book of Ecclesiastes, because sentence against an evil work, Go with me to Ecclesiastes. I need to just hit this here this morning. <clears throat> Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. This is a pretty profound scripture. Ecclesiastes. Chapter number 8 and verse 11. Could you just agree with me today that you will never ever be what God wants you to be without His presence in your life? Without His Spirit guiding you without Him revealing to you the truth of the Word of God that you can grow, without Him giving light into your life and bringing you that life that you need to live and take that next step day by day, would you just agree with me this morning that we can't do that without God? Man, I believe that with all my heart. But there's seasons of life when God sort of looks down on man and He tries their hearts. The Bible tells us there was a period in the time of Hezekiah's life where God looked down from heaven and said, I'm going to leave him just for a moment and I'm going to see what's in his heart. That's what the Bible tells us. He departed from him just for a season to see if Hezekiah really loved him. In other words, am I stirred up today just because of God or am I stirred up today because I really love God? You see, because the heart of man is revealed. The Spirit of God always wants us to love God. But there's something between there and it gets in the way and that's our soul. And sometimes the Spirit of God just sort of draws back from man just a little bit to try that heart to see, is he faithful? In other words, will they do it because it's right or will they do it because it feels right? Will they do it because they know the Word of God is, has proven that to be truth? Or are they going to do it because, well, you know, I, I feel like it's truth today 
So, you know, God tries the desires of our heart. And in Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11, of course, you know the story of Nebuchadnezzar, don't you? Nebuchadnezzar was lifted up with pride, and the Bible says God departed from him. He turned into a wild man. He was like an animal, which is still capable of every believer who doesn't uh, acknowledge God. They'll live a life of misery and destruction in their life. The Bible says you could do that as a believer. But when he came to himself, like the man in the pigsty in the book of Luke, the prodigal son, and he looked up towards heaven and said, Lord, you put man in the position they're in. You raise up kings. You put down kings. You're the God of gods. Then the Bible says God returned to him all that glory because he needed to learn a lesson. So I, I'd like to say this morning that, uh, you know, it's clear that God works with us patiently. God has a purpose in what he's doing in, his life, in our lives. And sometimes we don't understand his ways, but I assure you the longer you walk with God, the more his ways will be revealed to you. In Ecclesiastes 8, here's what it says. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, God's mercy, God's long-suffering, God's forgiveness, God's patience. You could just put in all that right there. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. And you, you know, Christians need to be careful not to harden their hearts to God because before you know it, it gets easy to not do what's right. It does happen. It does happen. And uh, so we'll, we'll go over here actually to Luke, and that's where I was getting to. Luke chapter 19. We're talking here a little bit about the patience of God. We're talking a little bit here about the servants of God. Amen. What they need to be and how God's patient with them. And let's look at this in Luke 19. Luke 19, have you noticed how many parables in the Bible have to do with the Lord dealing with servants and giving them time to do what they're supposed to be doing? Think about the, the, the parable of the marketplace where there are those that are standing idly by. And God says, please, the Lord of the field says, I'll hire you, I'll, I'll bring you in and use you. I'll, I'll be allowing you to be part of what I'm doing. I'm going to give you a stewardship in my field. And I'm going to reward you for the efforts that you're putting. Christian, I, I know that we forget this sometimes. And I know that we, we, we think in our mind it's wrong to do this. But you know, God is going to reward us for everything good and everything evil in our life. That's what the Bible says. Everything that man has done in his body, whether it be good or evil, will be rewarded. We need to understand that today. You know, God is going to give us rewards for being faithful as his servants. You need that encouragement this morning as a believer when the world or someone else in your life was saying, why are you doing this? Why are you faithful? Why would you want to do all this thing called Christianity? Why do you go to church? Why do you go to prayer meeting? Why do you, why do, you do these things in your life? You know what? I want to be faithful this morning to God. That's why I want to do it. And God always rewards those that are faithful. I can promise you today as your pastor that if you make every effort to do the will of God in your life, you will be rewarded. And it won't just be in heaven. You'll get rewards in this life. God will bless you with joy. He'll bless you with peace. He'll bless you with rest. He'll bless you with with serenity in your life. He'll give you growth in your life. He'll give you fruit in your life. There's rewards in this life as a Christian. God knows us to be human beings. But as according to Luke chapter number 19, God tells us here about this patience that he had with Israel. And if you know the story here, it's Zacchaeus. He gets saved. Amen. The wicked tax collector that God was patient with. He got born again and he gives his life to the Lord and he makes things right with the Lord and he starts walking with God. But the Bible tells us here that Jesus adds a parable to those that were standing by who were like this. Zacchaeus, that guy's a dirty, rotten tax collector. But the reality was Zacchaeus was looking for Jesus. And these Pharisees and Sadducees were not looking for Jesus. They were just going to be set in their ways. They were going to do what they told, wanted to do. And here's what the Bible says in verse 12. 
It says, he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. What's the problem with man and his God? Ultimately, ultimately. They don't want to say yes to God because in doing that, they're saying I'm accountable to God. He is my Lord and I am his subject. I dealt with a situation here at work this week. Thank God, a wonderful opportunity. A man beside me asked me a question. He said, so what's the difference between Catholic and Baptist? Whew, what an open door right there. What an open door right there. And of course, I went over some of the obvious fallacies of the Catholic Church. And I shared with them the difference between the baptism and what it means to have believers' baptism, to be born again. And he was raised as a Catholic. And he is one of those, you know, type of people now. Well, there's a lot of good moral things and all doctrines and, you know, all teachings. And they all have some good moral truth to them. And, and I understand where he's coming from. That's the doctrine of today, what we're dealing with. And most common people say all religions. And we're, we're coming and we're forming this big thing that says we're all the same. We're all spokes on the wheel. But here's the reality of it. If we believe that Christianity is true, then we believe that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on Calvary for our sins because we're sinners and we need to be saved. And if we believe that, there's a God that created the heaven and the earth and we are his subjects and he is Lord of all, then I have to look up to him and say, I have a moral problem called sin that needs to be dealt with. And I need to submit to him. And I need to listen to him. And you know, the same reality here is, is in the life of men versus their God, their entire life, Luke 19. Luke 19 says in verse 14, we will not have this man to rule over us. Christian, I want to remind you till the day you die, you're going to have a will. And that will is not always in line with God's will because we always, always, always have this flesh. I want to stop for a minute and just make a point. If Jesus Christ knelt in the garden of Gethsemane and said these words, not my will be done, but thine, who was a man not capable of sin. Grasp that for a minute. How often should that prayer be heard from our lips to our God in heaven? Not my will done, but thine, Lord. Because the reality of our life, if we're not subjected to God's will, and we're desiring our own thoughts, our own ways, what I think is right in my life, you know what? I'll never be a faithful servant to God. I'll never fulfill God's will in my life. And the Bible says in Luke 19, you say, well, Jesus said that because he was getting ready to have all that sin poured on. That's right. But you know, as a man, he understood what it meant to have a resistance of the flesh to God's will. And Christian, if we don't get a hold of that, when the flesh comes in and says, I want to do this, I want to look at that, I want to go there, I want to touch this, I want to taste that, I want to uh, do these things that the flesh wants, but God doesn't want in my life. If you don't grasp a hold of that thing, the Bible says the will of the flesh will take over your life and you'll not be a faithful servant of what God's given to you. Paul himself said, I bring my body into subjection. Apostle Paul, the man that God did, the greatest missionary work with. He said, I bring my body into subjection. He said in Romans, I hate the body of this death. Who's going to deliver me from the body of this death? He said, I thank the Lord that I can serve God in the spirit, in the mind of Christ. But this old flesh, I see no good thing in it. And I'm taking care of it every day saying, not the will of the flesh, but the will of the spirit. I'm crucified with Christ. I'm Dying to the old man, I'm renewing the new man every day. And Christians, we need the reality of that if we're going to be God's servant faithfully. Because the reality of it is in Luke 19, that was the problem with these men. Notice with me if you would. He said, occupy in verse 13 till I come. That means to be faithful, to use what I've given you, to take it and go and do something with it. But his citizens, verse 14, hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. 
Verse 15, it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. They did something with what God gave them. You see the point here? Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, done, well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful to very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said, Likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. I want to stop for a moment. We are living in a temporal world. Heaven and earth shall pass away, Jesus said. This, everything, we, we, we need this new fresh look this morning. Everything we see is just absolutely temporal. This is all going to go away. Every single bit of this, your job, your house, every, everything you see is going to be gone. It's going to be gone. And the Bible says our life's but a moment. It's just a, a, a vapor. We're here for a moment, then we, fly, then we vanish away. And what are we going to be left with forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and on and on as we often, the kids say in the, in the house, eternity plus one, right? For all the rest of any time that you can even grasp with your mind. Now listen to me for a moment. What we do with what God has given to us today is an eternal work when it comes to the rewards of our life. Oh, God, help us to be faithful. What if we faced every day and said, Lord, what I'm doing today is going to affect my eternity. I'm not that I'm not going to be in heaven. But according to this, the Bible says five cities, ten cities. I mean, when Jesus comes and reigns on earth and there's going to be all these nations, do you think somebody's going to be in charge of those nations? Do you think somebody's going to be in charge of those provinces? Do you think there's going to be people ruling over those places? Guess what? There are. We don't grasp this. A thousand years with the Lord. Hey, guess what? God has always given man something to do and there's something going on in heaven right now. That blows people's mind when they realize God has always had men to do something and he's always doing something with them. That means forever we're going to be doing something with God for God in some place that we've earned our reward or loss of reward. And we'll live with that forever. Is that a reality this morning in our life as we make the decisions about what will I do? It should be. But we're so close-minded. We're so, as you would say, short-sighted. Dear friend, this morning I could take my glasses off and read so clearly up close, but I can't see a thing afar off. And if God does not give us that long vision in our Christian life to see what these men should have been seeing, or we should say the first two men saw they were. They saw that long vision. But the first one said, now, the last one I should say, made this statement. Look at verse 20. Another came saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou layest not down and reapest that thou didst not sow. You say, Pastor, what does that mean? God's saying here to us, he is not going to cause us to be responsible for what we have in our life, because we're much is given, much is required. But also, he is going to expect us as Christians to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And it just as a tree would grow, and it had in the first year four pieces of fruit, and in the next year it had 30 pieces of fruit, and in the next year it has 100 pieces of fruit, God is expecting that same in our life as Christians. And we say, it's all right. I mean, I saw a peach tree the other day here at a man's house. It was the saddest, most decrepit looking thing I ever saw in my life. You know what happened to that peach tree? There's two things that could have happened. Either it wasn't cared for properly by the nutrients and the water that it needed, or whoever trimmed that tree didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> Amen. It was a mess. It had a little bu bush of a thing over here, and it had a little bush of a thing over here, and there sat the peach tree, and I looked at it and said, that's the saddest looking peach tree I ever did see in my life. But you know, properly cared for and purged as God would want us to be as Christians, we should have fruit in areas. And God's going to come in our life and say, you know what? Because you didn't obey me here, I'm not just judging you for here, but I'm judging you for out here. 
The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You say, oh, the judgment seat of Christ, it's not going to be that bad. I think it's going to be worse than we realize as born-again Christians. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of God, of the living God. And I think we preach so much of God's love, we don't really understand just how holy and just He really is as our Lord of our life. Dear friend, I'm ashamed this morning as a Christian as I preach. I'm preaching to the church and I'm part of it this morning. And sometimes this reality is not in our minds. Everything I do, everything I am, and everything God wants me to be is going to be judged by Almighty God. Dear friend, look at verse number 22. And he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou thy money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury? In other words, he, we're, we're to increase what God's given to us. We're to cultivate what God's given to us. And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound and give it to him that hath ten pounds. What? What? Left with nothing? Is it possible? This is, a, this is a very, very hard point to preach. Is it possible that people, there's going to be somebody in heaven that's a born again Christian that has nothing but Jesus? And I'm not saying that's idolatry because that's what heaven's going to be all about. But in other words, he won't have much of a reward. Everything's gone because he didn't do what God wanted him to do in his life. That's right. They're going to be walking around the streets of heaven saying, man, did I really miss what life was all about. But thank God I was saved. And that's, that's good. I'm th thankful we got saved. But finally, it says in verse 26, for I say unto you that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath, shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Obviously the context here of this parable is this wicked nation of Israel that had rejected their God and crucified him ultimately. And he was speaking to them. But Christian, let us not have the attributes of this self-willed men that resisted God and did not allow God to work in their lives. Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer here this morning. Father, we want to thank you for this message, Lord. I want to thank you for your direction. God, I thank you for the patience you have with us. Lord, that you are long-suffering. But you said the grace of God should be teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, and that we're to live soberly and righteously in this present world. Oh, we like the grace that says, oh, God don't really care about what I'm doing in my life. God, God just putting up with me another day, you know, because I'm a sinner. And we try to rationalize away our will as it resists yours. But God, one day we're going to stand before you and we're going to have to give an account. Because the Bible says, every man's work should be tried. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3 that there's going to be Three things present in the flesh, the wood, the hay, and the stubble. Those things we did in the flesh, those things that we did for our flesh and for our own will and to make ourselves happy. And God, I want to thank you that you're going to get rid of all those things. In eternity, there won't be any remembrance of it because it would bring us great sorrow. But Lord, you also said the things that would remain would be gold, uh, silver, gold, and precious stones. Lord, help us to lay up treasures in heaven. And one day we're going to understand that. We don't understand it now, but I believe one day we will when we're with you. And help us to believe you at your word this morning. And uh, Lord, do everything we can to live for you the last days. If this was our last week, what would we do for you? If this was the last day, what would we do for you? Help us to realize it is the end time. It's the last hour. And God, if we haven't been faithful in the past, what, let's do it right now. Let's get our lives right with God. Let's do everything we can to love you and to live for you, and to say, you are my Lord, you are my God, and I want to be your servant. 